Today is an important day to me. I think it should be normal for a son to be called to represent his father. In my case, it hasn't always been so simple. My father received a lot of awards. I don't even think he really knew how many. Today, he is going to be honored for his outstanding contribution to sport in Britain. 10 years after his death. My life is a long blur of nights out. I know I don't have a good reputation. I use a lot of drugs and a lot of alcohol and I've been with a lot of the wrong people in the wrong places. So I suppose I deserved it. Lovely. Just, just present that trophy for me, Alex, as well. That's lovely. Perfect. Give me a nice smile now. That's great. Alex was Thank George's you. second wife. I like her. She's nine years older than me, and I used to think it was so cool my dad had such a young, hot wife. Except the day he came home completely drunk and accused his 14-year-old son of having a relationship with his young fiance. He put his hand around my throat and he shouted, you are not my fucking son. My father will always be in my life as a distant figure, something out of focus, someone who was mysterious and fascinating. I spent years trying to get closer to him, failing every time. Everybody loved him, but I can't say that I never hated him.
complete name is Callum Milan Best. My dad gave me this name because of his mentor and chairman, Milan Mandarik. This city represents an important turning point for me. I spent one year modeling here when I was younger. I was 18 and living the dream. How are you, mother? Yeah, good, I'm just in Milan <clears throat> doing some filming. Um, Pretty tired, but it's my birthday. I feel good. Um, we're off to the tattoo convention to go do some filming there as well. Not to get tattooed, just to go do some filming. And then, uh, I know, I know. That's it, really. We just—it's been a good few days in Italy, but I'm looking forward to getting back now. I was in Malibu at the time, and I received one of the few calls I got from my father. He told me that Milan Mandrik offered me the chance to have a trial at Portsmouth, his football team in England. I had a decision to make and I came here. I'm Callum Best and I'm single. Well, relationship, my ideal woman, uh... Singing my praises, like blowing smoke about my ass. Uh, just to tune it. Just no, no, you don't. Do you have a, a favorite memory of your dad? Um, my favorite memory would be when I think I was about 12, maybe 13, and he took me to Old Trafford to watch United for the first time and bought me a best jersey. And I remember right. just, I remember just walking around the grounds and being super excited and super proud and, and a really cool moment. Do people constantly still talk about him to you? People you before yeah, when I'm here doing an interview about a new show at, at, at 35 years old, I'm still getting asked about my dad. But, yeah, I, but, I'm, but I'm okay with it because it's my dad and I'm his son and I'm born into this thing and I'm very proud of it. But I sometimes like, you know, think, oh, I've got so much going on and I've worked so hard to grow into my own person and do my own thing that there will be, I wonder if there will be a point where that ends. But if it doesn't end, so be it. This is the life I live and I'm happy with it. But sometimes I want to say, we don't need to talk about that. It has no relevance as such, but I'm grateful and I'm, and I'm blessed, but uh, I'll fucking sing his praises all day long. Sorry to keep swearing. No, 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 swearing's fine. Um, I suppose, it's, I mean, the reason it's tickling this century is because it's going to look at your life. Hi, Every time I land in Belfast, memories come back to me. I remember when my dad brought me here, I think I was probably about six or seven. Yes. And I was I had long blonde hair, I was yeah, real young. Yeah. And I remember, okay. yeah, and I remember, <laughs> I, I, I swear, like two weeks after we left, he said that the place got bombed or something like that. Quite so, possibly. Hey, that's right, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Did you meet my dad when he came in here? Many times. Did you? Many times. Great man. Yeah, you he was know, a good gentleman man, as always. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Lots of good memories from him. No, yeah, yeah. He told me. I texted my mom the other day and I said I was coming to the uh, the Europa and she goes, uh, he, my, "Your dad brought me there on a date one time, but we had to go through security because of all the troubles that were going yes, on as well." But I think he, he he liked this place and I know this place liked him as well. So. Well, he stayed here. I mean, as I say, I've been here 30 years, so I met him lots of times, yeah. you know, and uh, and also your grandfather as well. You know, yeah. he took him down to meet up. And they'd sit upstairs and have a, have a chat. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did you ever see him cause any trouble? Put the words right. Never, never. <laughs> never. I was like that. You're gonna be diplomatically correct. I knew that your father. Either. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, exactly. always a gentleman. Always, you know, we always had great times. Yeah. 
I love Belfast. It will always hold a place in my heart. On the day of my dad's funeral, you couldn't move from the amount of people lining the streets, hundreds of thousands paying their respects. Farewell, our friend, but not goodbye. Your time has come, your soul must fly. To dance with angels, find the sun, but how we'll miss our special one. He walked amongst us just a while, weaved your magic, made us smile. Your life was so full of light and tears, we lived it through you, through the years. We won't forget our Belfast boy, he filled our lives with so much joy. Your star will shine now in the sky, Farewell, our friend, but not goodbye. Losing my father sent me into a bad place. The worst, the lowest moments of my life. I began to believe I was worthless that my life had no purpose. I was nothing more than the son of my father, a father that rejected me all the time when he was alive. I was ashamed of myself. I didn't know that he was about to have a liver transplant. Nobody told me. I heard the breaking news that they had found a matching liver for the soccer legend George Best on the radio when I was in the cab. That was the day of the surgery operation. I went straight to the Cromwell Hospital. When he opened his eyes, he told me that it would be different, a new beginning. He'd never spoke to me like that. George Best is tonight facing a new battle against the bottle. It follows- I've known my father sober for about three weeks of my life. My dad is an idol to millions of people but he has suffered too. His mother died in October 1978, and he was devastated. He hadn't seen her for two years because he'd always run away from the trouble. Trouble in this case, of course, meant his mother's drinking. I guess he visited his family so rarely because he couldn't face seeing the state his mother was in. It's crazy to think, in this tiny little street, in this tiny little house, came one of the best footballers in the world. You know, like from such a small little place, right? Came this little guy, my dad, and he trained. Like this is where he grew up playing football. And he became one of the best football players in and the world. And he inspired so many people. Doesn't even look like my dad. <laughs> it looks like a, the like artist a, is really bad. Yeah, like it's incredible. His nose that. is like a. I'm not from London. I'm not grounded here. And for a long time, my life in this city didn't feel real. That's the main guy vibe. And then the women's, I, I just want to shoot every single kind. You know, because this, for me, we go women's black, we go women's white. Yeah, well, that's what we're doing. Cool. You can bring it downstairs. Girls, as soon as you've got your stuff on, just come downstairs, please.
I think the leopard print, yeah. it's one girl by herself, powerful. The brunette, yeah? How could anybody live up to a father like George Best? But at the time, I knew there was one way I could. By drinking and partying. What I do in my life hasn't been measured to what my legendary father did. When you were a myth, people always forgive you. For me, it wasn't always the case. He's a skinny little runt, isn't he? He's a fucking, he's anorexic. Oh, you look so good. And you don't. That's <laughs> why. <laughs> and you're a dick. And why don't you take a picture of me real quick, sweet. Yeah. You look so good. Your nails are really blue. That's fine. Callum, you're fucking treading on tin ice here, mate. You nearly got beaten up on the street. You're so lucky you didn't get bashed on the street. <laughs> what do you mean? I tried to fucking help you out, mate. I said get into a taxi. You nearly got fucking bashed on the street. Don't be such a fucking cocky prick. Can I Relax, man. Sorry? What do you mean relax? Don't be such a cocky cunt. You've nothing to back it up. My way with money is the same as my dad. I spend the cash as quickly as it comes, not saving anything. But the money I burn is mine. Once, a guy told me I'd wasted my father's fortune. This is what people think. George had no fortune and left me nothing. My obvious answer is that I want to do acting. You know, when I was younger and doing it, I enjoyed it, but I lost track of that. You know, I went to one of the best acting classes in Los Angeles, a place called Ivana Chubbuck, but I gave it all up when I came here, and I didn't follow that dream. You opened a Pandora's box when you came here, yeah. and those realities you couldn't avoid. And so in a way, it was safer for you. Now I need to move on with life. I need to find a girlfriend. I need to move on and build a serious career, you know? Now, perfect opportunity. Let's say I have a movie that starts filming in March. All I tell myself is I can't do it. You know what I mean? I say, fuck, oh, am I gonna be able to, to handle it? Well, am I good enough? Am I gonna thing? And I'm sure that's a lot of natural worries, but I should be like, fuck, yes, let's go do this. Let me go learn these lines. Let me go act this and I will nail it. But instead, I doubt myself. And I think that's because a lot of deep, dark issues of- You don't believe you're worth it. Yeah, of not believing I'm kind of worth it. You know, that is the truth of the matter. When I was younger, I didn't know what the name meant, you know, but now there's not a day goes by in my life now where somebody doesn't come up to me and say, your father is a hero, your father is a legend, we love him, you know? And I, it's just very careful for me sometimes because I like to keep my father here in that level of amazing footballer because I know that's what he wanted to be remembered as. But our relationship was a strange one to say the least, you know? We, we didn't know each other very well, you know? So I'm proud of the football that he did. And I watch the videos, I think amazing. Everybody tells me amazing, but there's more depth. I need to find more depth to my relationship with my dad, you know? And now that he's gone, I can't ask him, you know? Because when he was around, I couldn't ask him because he was always drinking. You know, his brain was always fogged up and, and screwed up because he was always drinking. I know everybody has their problems, but my stuff is very public in this country. I never really tried to find out answers or questions because I never want to piss people off, you know? Andiamo. <laughs> so there's a bed and, bed and breakfast here, you know, like a hotel, but really small, cheap, single bed, small things. So my dad put me in here. Uh, one of my trips, I was over for three weeks, you know? And uh, he put me in there for one week 
and then the week finished, and I said to the people, I said, listen, I'm gonna stay longer. And I didn't tell my dad I was gonna stay longer, but the rooms were 40 pounds a night, yeah? yeah. 40 pounds a night, That's right? Nothing. So I stayed for another week. Alex, the wife, my dad found out I stayed. She went to the papers and said, Callum steals credit card and runs up hotel bill, yeah? All over the English press, it made it look like that I took their credit card and put myself in some luxurious hotel. But if you look through the windows, it's a small shithole. And that's when I realized how kind of screwed up the re screwed up the relationship is because even my dad didn't care that she, the wife, went to the papers and said, Callum takes credit card, checks into beautiful hotel when I'm in some fucking shithole. Like Newspapers love to make that connection, like father, like son. I don't see myself as the same kind of drinker as my dad. I drink socially, not on my own and not every day. I'm a different person. I didn't mind being described as a playboy, but when playboy turned to C.D. Lothario, something had to change. I have to solve my identity problem, who I want to be. Hey! Myself or the son of a great footballer. For a long while I had some fantasies of being a footballer. But pretty soon it became clear to me that I'm not as good as people would expect me to be, being the son of George Best. My dad cast a big shadow. College wasn't for me, but I had another option. Modeling. At the beginning, nobody knew who my father was. When George ended up in the hospital again in 2000, suddenly a move to London made perfect sense to me. I decided to pack up my life in LA and move close to my father. I had no idea of what was going to happen. Here I spent an important part of my life. Many good things and many bad things happened to me. I'll never forget the first time I read my name in the press next to Kate Moss and Mick Jagger, just because I was at the same party. I will also never forget the Christmas I spent eating beans alone on my sofa. Angie moved to the U.S. to be a model and dated a few Hollywood stars. Oh. Wow, she's gorgeous. Isn't she beautiful? Is that nice, Mama? Are you enjoying the sunshine today? With a little white dot in her two... What, what, is she two-toned or is she just shaved? Shaved. Here we go, Mama. It's for you. Mm, yeah. When my parents were together, she tried to make their relationship perfect. She didn't understand alcohol dependence. I carried painful anger with me for a long time. It hasn't been easy for her raising me as a single mom. Years ago, I wanted to do an autobiography book, right? And nobody, because years ago, I wasn't quite clear-headed as I am now. Nobody years ago was keen to do it. Finally, now, I put a treatment First, I wanted to do an autobiography about my whole life, right? Telling the days of Malibu, telling the days of going to Milan, telling the days of the Playboy Mansion, the partying and the father and the how I am now, you know? Nope. Why? 
Well, just because I want to do an autobiography. No, nothing deeper than that. People are doing autobiographies. People are buying houses from autobiographies they sell. And I've had a fucking crazy life, you know what I mean? What it's come down to is this. I now have got this agreement from the uh, publishing house that said we were happy for you to do a book. Then I thought, holy shit, I don't know enough about my old man to write a fucking book. The thing is, is you are the only person that I know that really knew my dad. You know what I mean? And that's why I think during this whole process, you will be someone I keep coming back to and saying, okay, mom, this has happened. Is that any truth? Is you, do you remember that? This is your journey. Yeah. This is a boy's journey to find out who his dad was. Yeah. Because his dad was drunk every day of his life. Yeah. And that, how sad is that? Yeah, proper. But think how many more. I get anxiety thinking about it, you know what I mean? Even if it's selfish or not, fuck it, I'll be selfish yes, for a minute. Yes, be yeah? selfish, babe. Because it's time for this me to say, you. now all of you who are going to view this can see what I've dealt with, what shit I've gone through. I'm blessed in many ways, but fuck me, there was some dark shit along the way, yeah. you know? Yeah. But biggest fear I have is that everybody I knew loved my dad. And now I've got to sow some shit that ain't so pretty. But I don't want it to be a nasty thing. No. And I don't want it to be a thing that actually even tarnishes him. I just want people to see a, fa a son trying to figure out who his alcohol dad was. Because I'm in the limelight at the end of the day. You know I said Elton and Rod and all these people expected their version of George. Yeah. Well, he had to live up to that. Yeah. And in living up to that, he became a victim of his own reputation. I want to find people that could tell me a fucking conversation they had with my dad. A fucking deep conversation, you know? That's what, I, I, I never had a deep conversation with him. I'm sure you had a few, but I want to know who the fuck spoke to my dad on normal terms, you know? What the fuck did he like to do? What did he talk about? When, who has a goddamn real- He was very introverted. Yeah, I thought so as well. Even, even when I would be with him, he would go into a bar and he would sit in the corner by himself doing crossword puzzles. Yeah. Didn't want to know, didn't want to talk. No. People would approach him. he didn't have to. Yeah. He never had to. It was always George. And then everybody, he never had to go and get anything. Yeah. It all came to him. Yeah. It's a bit like your life. You've never had to go and get anything. Yeah. It's all come to you. Yeah. It's a natural progression of from your father to the son. Yeah. And you're lucky that you've come out because there are lots of people, lots of movie stars and famous people whose children didn't come out good on the other yeah. end. Yeah. The charisma that yeah. came out of that man. The, there was something, he walked into a, okay, I used to say, I could walk into a room with George stark naked and nobody would know. All the eyes would be on George, on which was the truth. Yeah. It, it, the fascination with him because of his looks, his charm, the blue eyes, the dimple. Yeah, great. Un speechless. Oh, bless him, isn't it? Yeah. Bless him. Bless him, innit? My dad is a stranger to me. He's never explained it to me himself. People knew him very well, describing his mysterious magnetic aura. I never had access to it. Phil was much more than a simple agent for George. He wrote a book titled, Remember Me From My Football. He was always there for him. He was the man that knew him the best. There he is. There's some fetching headgear on. I remember quite clearly um, when George was living in Oakley Street that he'd said to, he had a big box of trophies and he said to Calvin, take your pick, whatever you want. And there was the European Football of the Year award there and uh, British Football of the Year award and various other nice awards. And Callum picked out a snooker trophy, you know, that George had won in a pub. So he wandered off, he took a, I'm sure he still got it, hopefully. He took that back to uh, America with him. Some memorabilia that George has given me over the years and, you know, as much as I love it myself, um, I'd like Callum to have it, because I know he, he didn't have anything from his dad. I was a big fan of George Best and Manchester United, and I'd heard that he was associated with the bar just down the road from where I was working in Regent Street. So I popped in there for a drink one night 
and George walked in, which was amazing. And uh, he said hello, and I was I was doing a crossword. And George stood next to me, and he was looking because George was fanatical about crosswords. Um, just looked over my shoulder, and he he said, "Are you stuck with that?" And I wasn't at all, but I said yes. So he started helping me with the crossword. He said, uh, are you here tomorrow night? And I had no intention of being, but of course, again, I said yes. And I went there and we started chatting again and we just built up a friendship over there. Right now I am calling my bank to transfer back 2,000 pounds to the agent for um, the club that Callum missed on Friday, the PA that he missed. Because he was out and he disappeared for a few days. <clears throat> Just be a second. It's painful. My father had a glint in his eyes that could make everything possible. His sentences are still famous. I spent a lot of money on booze, birds, and fast cars. The rest I just squandered. The irony is I lost my dad to these subjects. I'd heard this phrase, you know, I wasted a lot of money on uh, fast cars um, and women, and the rest I squandered. And I said this to George, and said, that's a good line, and it? It's quite funny. And, he, and I'm 100% certain he said, no, John Conte said that. But he must have used it at some stage later, because um, he did laugh at the time when I said, hey, he said, yeah, it's good, that. But I'm sure he said it was John Conte saying, John Conte had said it first. But he obviously had, had used it uh, later on because uh, it's now famously associated with George. I can't imagine the shit Phil had to put up with from my dad all over the years. We never ever fall, fell out and argued. You couldn't strong arm George into doing anything. If George didn't want to do something, he wouldn't do it. Whatever the money or for whoever it was. It's no secret that George um, had a huge drink problem. And it wasn't just you know, go out and have a few drinks and get drunk. It was, it was a ridiculous amount of drink. I hated him drinking brandy. And I could go through a bottle a night of brandy. Of course I was worried about George. And we used to talk about the drink. And he'd always say, I'll be all right, Yuzi. Don't worry about me. I'll be all right. Um, but no, to try and stop him drinking, you know. What would you do? Wherever he, he went, he could get a drink. You know, it'd be like when he's, and he, he stayed here a lot. You know, what, was, what should I do? Hide all the bottles of wine or, or whatever? You know, all I'd do is, is drive him away. At least when he was here, he was safe. 2005, the 20th of November, News of the World published this picture with a warning. Don't die like me. The 25th of November, George dies. He's 59 years old. He wanted that picture taken and he was quite happy for it to be in the, in the press for a lesson for, for people who were just starting their drinking careers to show, you know, it's not a pretty ending. Which it wasn't, it was dreadful. I certainly wouldn't have ever taken that picture if I thought that was the last picture I was ever going to take of him. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I think it's genetic. I don't know if it's true, but I heard stories that he was apparently meant to be in the photo for the cover of the Beatles, Abbey Road. He was called El Beatle, and he had to be the fifth person crossing the street. He simply didn't show up. In 2015, I wrote and released a book about my relationship with my father. 
I started the book by admitting that I was terrified of what people would think of me after they read it. I think it was a bit of a shock. There were a lot of older people like Michael Parkinson, Jimmy Tarbuck, who said, don't do it, save it for the sh your shrink. But I think the book being published was really good for Callum. It's a big, ah, <gasps> for him. It's a big sigh, a big relief. And I think now he can move forward, recognizing that he is George Best's son, but he's also Callum Best. My dad became an iconic figure. He has millions of fans that adored him. People don't like to see the dark side of their heroes. Even Barbara, the sister of my father, said that George Best would feel betrayed by me. It hurts. When George died, Callum inherited his uh, reputation. And he took it and ran with it and was very good at it. I think he's still a California guy, tell you the truth. He grew up in Malibu, and so he considers Malibu home. Freedom of lifestyle, that easiness, is who he is. He's a very free spirit. Everything I experienced made me the man I am now. But it was not easy to have him as a father. Without my mom, I don't know what would have happened to me. I didn't want to come home. I did not want to come back to this country. I was living in Malibu. It rains two weeks out of the year, and when it does rain, it's lovely warm rain. You don't get old in Malibu. <laughs> you get old in this country very quickly. I had to come here. I couldn't let my son go the same way as my husband. I couldn't lose two of them that way. George took care of George, and everybody else around him had to fend for themselves, and Callum was one of those. He may have had George Best for a dad, but he also had a drunk for a dad. I mean, and a serious drunk. Drunk, 24-7, 365. So, oh, he was learning his lessons the hard way, I think. It'll be interesting to see what happens in the future. In late 1975, my dad is in Los Angeles playing football. Soccer isn't America's main sport, so we could live a different kind of life. We could sit in a bar, relaxing in a way that it was impossible at home. It was peaceful for him. He owned a bar at Hermosa Beach, Besties Bar. How are you? Yeah. I'm Callum. Brian Burroughs. Brian, nice to meet you. Thank you for having us in here. Pleasure. I was, uh, I was, telling, I was saying that um, it's a, I used to come back uh, down here when I was about 11 years old with my dad. Uh, I have great memories of him teaching me how to play pool over there. And in the corner there, you guys have a big plaque, and there's a picture of my dad and Pele that I'd never seen before. And I thought all these years later, it's been about 15 years since I've been here. My dad passed away 10 years ago. And uh, I was wondering if this place still existed. I heard a few times it would change names, but it looks identical to what it was before, you know? Yeah, I did so. want to give this to you, which that was the oh, uh, wow. family plaque that was from your, from your dad had up there over our bar from That's right, because uh, Bobby McAlinden was the other owner, and then yeah. my dad's one there. Yeah. Wow, so how long have you guys had this? Uh, we've had that for 15 years now. Wow. Okay. But it's been there. It was Your dad put it over the bar you know, when he owned oh, the place. Well, that means a lot, man. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. I really do appreciate it. So the day that your father was buried, the family crest was behind the bar on a big giant mirror, and the evening that he was buried, yeah. it fell off the wall and no it was there for 20-some years no or longer way. than that, and it was that night that it came crashing down. Which oh, wow, that's crazy. Is, yeah, it's totally creepy, and it's sort of been a big story that we, everyone here has known that that happened. I didn't so, know that, man, yeah. so thank you for sharing that yeah. with me. So, that's a cool uh, sign, huh? And everyone was, uh, you know, the ghost of your father, <laughs> you know, we're going to talk about putting it back up. Uh, right. And we've just, we've had it down in a special place. 
I have so many stories to tell here that I don't even know where to start. But I had a great time with my dad here in Hermosa. I still remember my mom's face the first time she left me here alone with my dad. We were just another father and son, cycling along, playing pool, playing darts. Here, my dad was free of his demons. In a certain way, my story starts here. One day, my mom gets a call from Ed Peters, a friend of George, saying that George wanted her to come to a party at his bar. When she gets to the bar, there is no party, just George waiting for her. Accepting this invite, she puts herself in the line for all kinds of heartache over the next few years. George had arrived in Los Angeles six years before. My mom was working for Cher as a personal trainer and assistant. Jack Nicholson once took her out for dinner. Jack then sent her yellow roses the next day, waiting to see her again, but she wasn't interested. Cher was baffled. Why is beautiful Angie turning down famous movie stars to hang out with this little drunk Irishman? And that's why she married him in January 1978, even though by now she knew exactly what he was like. When I'm nine, George and Angie are divorced. My dad lived in London and arranged to come over for a visit to see me. I was so happy about this. We went to the airport to pick him up, but he wasn't there. My mom knew his habits, so we drove to Hermosa Beach to look for him. Where was he? In a hotel, sleeping off all the drinks he had had on the plane. In the end, I didn't see him at all on that visit. In July 1986, my relationship with my father was about to enter a new phase. My mom applied for divorce and for sole custody of me. It was the start of my mom's plan to move us back to the States. I wonder quite often what my life would have been if my mom hadn't made this decision. But I never doubt she made the right call. My mom and I were the poorest family among all my friends. But we lived close to the beach and we were very blessed. Here, I was me first, and I was George Best's son second. How's Simon, dude? I saw you fucking chilled with that dude. Adam is my best yeah, mate. Yeah, like, I'll come pick you up, let's go, let's go. Because I see when I walk into the fucking room. We grew up together. Yeah. I come here and I see where you're at, and I think to myself, God, my best mate, who I've known for fucking how many years? 20. Fuck. No, 21 years. Known for 21 years. But I come here and you're on PCA, Pacific Coast Highway, overlooking the ocean. I'm like, God damn, I want to be in the next flat next to you. When am I going to make that move? So. You know, me and you are like fucking Mike Tyson, bro. Yeah. We're either rich as shit, <laughs> like, because we move, that's how we live. We live off big rips. Yeah. Like, we either make big rips, yeah. and then it's just like... <laughs> I don't know how I'm eating beans on toast, but the world, <laughs> they think I'm dominating the world. I sometimes think what, how different it would have been if I stayed in Malibu. So then 18 comes around and everybody goes to, to college to either Santa Barbara or San Diego, but I know what that consists of, like two years of getting completely pissed and then bailing out of school. And I just think to myself, I, have to, I, I just remember I, I had an opportunity to go travel Europe and I thought I've got to take that opportunity. But then I look at all my friends, like I look at you or I look at like Pascal or I look at Bo or Brody even, and everybody still lives here and like, 
they're totally, I mean, I'm content where I am, but I just think sometimes how different my life could have been if I stayed here and grew up in Malibu. What would I have done as a career choice? Like, what would I be doing with my life? But I never surfed, you know what I mean? Yeah. But the one thing we did do at this beach really well was throw parties. Like we would come here when we were in high school. I remember that big F-150 truck. Yeah. We used to go pick up the kegs, yes. kegs of beer, throw them in the back, yes. call everybody we knew and say, meet us down at the hut yeah. in Little Doom. Bonfire. And how old were we, like 16? 16, 16, because it was the one place it's like adults couldn't find you or get to you. Yeah. And what's funny, you know, it's funny about being young, like this was like our version of going out. Yeah. Like you're five feet away from your front door, like at the beach, and we felt like we were 100 miles away. Totally. And there were so many stories that I was nervous to tell because how much admiration there is for my dad, you yeah. know? Every single day, someone's like, oh my God, we love your dad. You know, he's such an icon, he's such a legend, and he is many of those things, but you know that yeah. my dad is my dad. He wasn't George West football, he was just my dad, you know? Yeah. You gotta understand, man, so this is how cool George was, because when I went to London, I was in my super punk rock phase. I was like, wore shirts that said white trash, like holes ripped in my big, like, like cut up jean shorts, you know? And, um, your dad was just so mellow and cool. You were vibing. You're like, dude, come on, man. Get it together, bro. Like, we're in London. What was your intro to him? Because I remember you, I remember before I went, me, if I had to explain to people about what my dad did or what, I, I never really, I was like, oh, he was an ex-footballer or ex-soccer player, but nobody over here kind of really understood no, that. You not know? at all. So we start walking and he's getting like mobbed. And yeah. I could legitimately see people shivering like Michael Jackson just walked past totally. him. Like, and I'm like, dude, what does your dad do? And you're like, he plays soccer. Yeah. And I'm like, no, that can't be it. Like yeah. he was in a movie or something, right? You're like, no, dude, he legitimately just plays football. Yeah. And then that night, we, you guys drove me up to Manchester where he was commentating a game. That's how you say it, right? Yeah, commentating. Yeah, yeah. commentating a game. And then I watched a Man, a Man U game and I watched, looked at the fans in the audience. I'm like, oh, okay, I get it, yeah. You understood played, the played, level. He plays soccer. People are like eating their young. And he was so happy to take good care of us. But at the same time, we'd get there and he'd go on such heavy, wow. He'd go on such heavy sessions of drinking that we would, he would, we, we were literally left to our own devices. So I did this book, dude, and the book is so hardcore because it talks about so many issues we went through that you were with me for a lot of them, you know? So I put that out there and I was really worried about how it would react. The negative feedback came from people that didn't read it. They only read inserts of kind of yeah. heavy shit, you know? Or people from Northern Ireland that are just, they, hide him, they hold him at such a level of God, yeah? That they don't want to hear a bad word said, yeah. you know? I lost my dad, I was fucked up for a while. So my mom kind of packed her shit up to come see me. Luckily, you know, I'm fucking luckily sorted my life out in a great way, so it's all good. In the UK, because I've been there for 15 years, they only kind of know me as being George Best's son. Right. They don't know that I came from a place where nobody even fucking knew George Best was, right. and I was happy here. Right. And I had a cool life, dude. But I packed right. my shit up to go get to know him, and the motherfucker died. Right. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? Right. So, so that's what How I'm just... soon after you got there? Right? I, we tried for a few years, but because he was so heavy in the drink, you know, that... He didn't really know how to give back anything. So like, yeah. we went to football, we talked about girls. And there's no depth to it, you know, and uh, fucked me up a bit, you know what I mean? But uh, yeah, exactly. Do you mind, brother? Thank you. No, not at all. Come on in. Me getting all dressed up Love and shit. that. Yes. She's gonna be like, oh, no. Love that. Send her my love. What we'll do, you guys off? Good luck, yeah. Cool, nice, nice to meet you, brother. Friend. All the best, yeah. Thank you very much. We happily moved back here, because obviously my mom moved back to the UK because I was messed up years ago. Now she's built a little home for herself, so I couldn't just pack up my bags and move back here without her. I'd have to remember, I'd have to get her a place, myself a place, so it, it's a big process. I mean, in the UK, I got sucked into this kind of, I don't want to say celebrity, because you know some people might not knew, know who I am, but this kind of world of becoming a persona of George Best's son, and they only know me as this kind of city football and dad stuff. They don't know about where I really grew up, you know? My next step after Malibu, after seeing my friends, is then going to San Jose where 
I'll see my aunts and I'll see my cousins. What I want to learn from them is that who was my dad when he had me? Because they knew my dad when I was born. George said, at the end, people will only remember the football. This is not true. I can't. I just wanted to be able to sit down with him and talk about his life. I just know what I've read or watched on a video or been told. We were 18 and uh, we had a team and we entered this competition and we ended up winning it. And I remember we all ended up leaving with rings. The, the, the parents all chipped in and got us rings. And as minor as it might sound, it's a major memory for me because it was when I was serious about football and we played every single day. This is my little claim to Malibu right here. It's been here for since 1998. So I think that's quite cool. Quite proud of that one. Oh yeah. Very good. Yeah, I actually coach the soccer camp here in Malibu. Oh yeah. Yeah. No worry. What team's that then? No, it's just a, a kids kind of like coast to coast summer camp. It's not like. A, Very cool, yeah. man. It's funny because I brought this. Uh, I came back here because I was remembering. There's a sign over there that says the AYSO. When I was, God, when I was probably about 13 to about 17. This is the field that I used to play on. Oh yeah. Yeah, man. There used to be the goals up, and we went and traveled around and teams used to come here and it was such great memories it's like the pitch doesn't get much better than this does it this really is, and the views I, really it's incredible, my, I think about some of the pitches i play on now in london and it just blows it away doesn't it <laughs> you know i didn't start playing football till about 13 but i found out i was pretty damn good at it but when they found out my dad was george best everything changed it was the first thing they judged me on In 1994, the World Cup is on. Everybody was football mad that summer, even in the US. That summer, I invited my dad to coach a training session for my local soccer team, the Malibu Surf. That day, there were more people on the field than ever before. He worked us hard. And at the end, all the fathers asked for pictures with him. It was a proud moment, one of the best days of my life. I am born in San Jose, California, when George was playing for the San Jose Earthquakes. My Auntie Lindy still lives here. She's the sister of my mom and married to Chris Dangerfield. Aston Villa. So this is the uh, shirt I wore in the first soccer ball, which is for Portland Timbers. Here at Spartan Stadium, once again, we played Tampa Bay Rowdies. She was at that particular time, probably, if not the, one of the best players in the world. Um, I mean, even Pelé said that he was the best player in the world. And it was a pleasure just to meet him, number one. You know, the opportunity to play against and then play with and spend some time with him on a personal basis. I mean, these are the sort of things that you would, um, you know, you just put it into your um, special memory bank and you say, these, these were good times. When you had a chance to spend time with George in public settings, even in America, you could see the adoration and, you know, what a star he was. But in his everyday life, he could sort of walk around the streets somewhat unnoticed. And uh, I think that was kind of a novelty. It must be to these guys. It wasn't to me because I wasn't that famous. But to players like, like he was, uh, it must be quite a, uh, um, 
a peaceful feeling to know that you could have a normal life again after the life he had led. He was basically at the end of his career when he came here. I think he knew that he wasn't the legend that he used to be. Um, my gut feeling is George always made an impact. And if he was going to go, it was going to be with a bang. And he did it. I was fortunate because a lot of the time I spent, especially here in San Jose, when I was down in Los Angeles at Besties, yeah, when everybody was having a beer and it was a lot of fun and there's the stories about that. But when he was here in San Jose, when I came here, um, he was actually going through a period. Callum had just been born. Uh, I think it was a very positive period in his life. Uh, he was really trying to make an effort to not have that be something that was, you know, constantly nagging away at him and was distracting him away from his family life that was important to him at the time. So um, th there was a good period of time here in San Jose that he wasn't drinking. At that point, life was good. I was um, at an age that I should stop modeling and she married George and she needed some help. So I came and stayed with them when they were in Florida, when they were in LA, and when they had the baby, then she definitely needed help. And so um, I closed down my store in, in uh, London and just moved over here. I arrive on 6th of February, 1981 at 7.02 a.m. Pacific time, which is 3.02 p.m. in the UK. This is pretty much exactly the same time and date of the Manchester United Munich air disaster in 1958. This coincidence pleased my dad a lot. Before I was born, he made all kinds of promises about how things would be different when he was a father. He stopped drinking for a few months, and he even tried feeding me on his own. George loved people in his own way. He could only give so much. Um, he loved Ange to death, but he hurt her by doing what he did. He loved Callum, but it was a distant relationship. Unfortunately, uh, when she would send him off to, to go see him, he would go out and leave him in the hotel room or the apartment and stuff like that. So he just, he just couldn't help himself. Well, I think that's a disease, right? I mean, that's something that you have and you need to have treatment to, to try and lose that problem. Um, I don't think it's something he set out to do. Um, I think that certainly you know, he got to a point probably in his life where he had, as you say, he was so talented and he, he was a very good looking guy and he could do whatever he wanted to do. Um, and maybe at times he got bored and he found that this was something he could do as an escape from things. But really, he tried to get by with it. And, and what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that, he, you know, he, he tried to deal with it in the way that he could. I don't think he wanted to be an alcoholic, but none of these people really do, do they? I mean, you know, that's, that's, what, that's why they call it a disease. The first time Callum was out as a newborn baby was at that stadium, and he scored that goal, and when he went through, like, five guys, and it was, like, the goal of the century. Um, So I know this is the old stadium, but someone said they might have this this thing they uh, dedicated to him. But yeah, yeah, they might. Yeah, let's go in here and ask. No worries, Sire. Thank you. The San Jose Earthquakes, and I know they don't play here anymore. They've moved to the new stadium. But uh, a friend of mine that used to play back in the day said they used to have a gate or a uh, a entranceway that was a tribute to him called the George Best Gate. Do you hear anything like that? A name? No. No. Do you know if they where they would move any old school stuff? Would they keep it around or? No. No. No worries. No, it's all good. I'm, I'm a big soccer fan. Okay. So I would know that here. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. Classic. I don't know. No, a guy named George Best. Do you know the name? No. Okay. It's a long time ago. It is very cool for me to be here. It's very cool for me to come back to somewhere where I was actually born that I know really nothing about.
and I can look at this pitch, and I can look at that stadium, and I can picture everybody going crazy, and, I can, and I've seen the video in my head 7,000 times. That's tough to stop, the damn breaks, and boy, it's tough to control. Best maneuvering unbelievably. Best still has it, I don't believe this move. He's ah! saved! I was on the sideline, and I don't remember it because, if I'm honest with you, most of the memories I have of my dad and of here are a blur. You know, nothing is focused. Nothing. I can't see it. I can't picture anything perfectly, but I can feel it. I can know it was there, and I and I have blurred things. I have people telling me things, but so I'm trying to figure it out for myself and trying to put it, all the pieces together and gain the knowledge for myself to make it all make sense. But it feels good being here. I th it feels great, though. I think to myself, God, my dad was there at that one point, you know? And I s it might sound silly to some people, but it makes sense. And I feel him, and I think, wow, that's pretty fucking cool. Oh, an outstanding goal. Unbelievable goal by George Best. <laughs> Look at that move. And how about this one? Look at all the defenders trying to contain him. Never seen one better oh than that, boy, Joy. That was really fine, wasn't it? I've never seen one even close to that. Uh, George Best. He did it he all by himself. <laughs> When I'm a month old, George goes into rehab and is away for months. Jack Rosenthal met him that time to write a screenplay about him. He wrote, George Best, on the surface, is not the most sympathetic of characters. He is immensely charismatic and he has developed the Irish charm, boyish charm and macho magnetism into a fine art. That's how his meanness should be played. Jack spent days with George and Angie to write the script. In one of the last scenes, George meets a great fan of his in a little California truck stop. He had just come out from a rehab and he is supposed to be off the alcohol. But when the man offered him a beer to celebrate, he accepted. He was a slave of the image he created. George once said, having Callum prove one thing, alcohol become the most important thing in my life, more important than my wife, and even more important than my newborn son. I felt guilty I couldn't stop drinking, even for him, and probably drank even more because of my guilt. A few months before my second birthday, my dad moved back to the UK. One messy night out, my brain goes back to how it used to be. The demons come back. I don't know, that's my son, it's grandma. Where's Callum? One of those school shots. That's me, modeling, you don't want that. <laughs> the family. This is not one of them. No, these are my side. I'll find more. I mean, there's stuff with him and Ange still, but whether he wants simply the best on there or not, I don't know. My mother kept all of these things. It was all, it was all over everywhere. Callum became a lost soul for a while. We all know that. The tabloids, everybody knows that. Wow. My mum kept everything. Oh, there he is. I was his second mum. There was no no question of it, because Ange needed to get back to work. All the stuff was going on with George. That was Grandma's 80th, and we were all together. He was always with us. 
and very close to his cousins and still is, as we know, because they're not here yet. <laughs> hey! Hey! <laughs> I did what you asked me not to do. You know? uh -huh. Oh no, please don't blame me though. Oh, I'll blame See my sons. Fucking blame all of us together. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to the stories. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm going to get dressed and then I'm going to have a cigarette and then I'm going to have a shot of Don't get on camera. Mm. Oh. Checkbook. George left me his whole checkbook. Signed. The whole book is signed. About 12, 14. Do you remember this? Oh, you know what? I fucking wish that I had some potential with this thing. <laughs> this one. I love. That one. Oh my goodness. That's, that's how much your dad trusted me. My family is very small. Me, my mom, my aunt, and a few cousins. I lost half of my family when my father died. I heard a story when I was a teenager about a sister I could probably have. It seems to come from a relationship my dad had before my birth. My mom thinks the story is a hoax, something George used often as an excuse to have a drink. I'm very blessed with the name I have. If I really do have a sister out there somewhere, I would love to meet her. But in some ways I think, maybe she doesn't want to meet me, as she would have by now. I hate to say it, but to be a soccer legend doesn't mean being a good human being. Sometimes I thought that being self-destructive is genetic. Anyway, I can't blame someone for all the wrong that's happened to me. Feeney Arms was his favorite place. During my summer visits, I spent most of my time here, playing cribbage and watching football. Now it looks very different from that time. It wasn't a healthy space, and he spent from eight in the morning till 10 at night every day. He was a legend, but his only will was to spend the whole day here, drinking with normal people. Oh my goodness gracious me. Now, I'm finally ready to meet Phil. I <laughs> oh, can't believe you dragged me back in. I know, Phil, I'm sorry. The only one really who knew who my father was. What kind of man he was behind the icon of George Best. Is it Gallianos? Gascoigne. It's not Gascoigne, no. Is it not? Because uh, he was with us, wasn't he? He was. Oh, it is Gascoigne. It is. But he signed it twice then. <laughs> <laughs> you signed it twice, bless him. Um, I've seen another Gaza somewhere. You probably did. Let's think about it. Well, yeah. He was is he, is it even worth going in there or not? Should yeah, we just let's have a look in there. Oh, God, no. The bar was in the middle here. It was so just a. When, when Phil and I used absolute, to come, it was literally you'd walk in and then it would just be, there was a square bar in the middle and it was like the floors were old. It was not the nicest of places. And they had no back. And my dad used to sit in the corner over there, you and him there. We shared a lot of intense moments. I used to wonder, I used to walk in there sometimes and think to myself, 
god, my dad is he's one of these fucking iconic heroes yeah. to so many. Yeah. What is he doing staying in a place like this? Exactly. But then I used to think to myself, it's probably because he wants a bit of quiet, a bit of time out. But even if he was in there, he, people would still fucking yeah, hound him. He was a man of the people, honestly. I don't think you saw as much, but he was just a people's person. Yeah. And he would mix with anyone. Yeah. You could sit him next to anybody and he'd get, you know, we had a, we were in Monte Carlo and he was sitting with Prince Albert, chatting away like old friends. And Albert invited him back. He said, George, you must come back. And sadly, he passed away that year. Wow. George started a company to manage the George Best brand. And he asked me and Phil to be part of it. This meant the world to me, being part of my dad's legacy. And in the end, it didn't work. I never understand why. I know how important you were to my dad. I know how important my dad was to you. And I just said to myself, why have I never come to you with questions yeah. before? But it's what's happened to me, Phil, is that I have to crack on with my own shit, yeah. you know? Because if I come to you and start th worrying about my past and my things and my things, I'll never grow as my own person. My book, for example, wasn't in any way to put my dad down because I'm fucking, besides you, I'm his number one fucking fan, you know what I mean? And love him to bits. But in this book, I had to explain all this shit that's going on inside of me. Phil, I was worried to see you because you remind me so much of my dad. I swear to God. And it upsets me because it reminds me, not in a bad way, but it upsets me because I think to myself, God, you were, you and my dad were like wingmen, you know? And every time I saw my dad, I saw you. Every time I needed to talk to my dad, I'd talk to you, you know? And so, uh, oh, it could kick me off, but uh, you, you could tell that he was my fucking everything, you know? I came here to get to know him. There's no denying the fact that he adored you, Callum. You know, and that was the other thing, the sad thing about your book, you know, that you didn't realize that how much he did love you. When I would be coming over, would my dad talk about me? Your dad wasn't the type of person to say, come on, Callum, let's go to Alton Park Towers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Or fucking give me a hug or tell me you love me. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. football with me, he did that yeah, well. Yeah. Talk about girls, he did it with me well. Yeah. But he didn't know how to really show any emotion to me at all. I genuinely don't remember him really giving me a hug properly. I don't remember him really telling me he loved me properly. Yeah. And do you think that's because he just was an old school Irishman? He didn't know how to do that, or? I wish you knew him yeah. like I did, because he was certainly a better friend to me than he was a father to you. Yeah. But he would have become a father, a great father to you. I wish he had been. And, and yeah, but it's just too late at the end. It took me a while to get my head together. A fucking while, you know? I was snorting, I was drinking, I was doing everything I shouldn't do, you know? I, my closest source of not dealing with the fact that my dad just died was going out and getting drunk. And I literally did that every night for fucking three years. Older. I know he want, wanted to spend more time with you. You know, it's something he talked about when, um, after he'd split from Alex, about getting somewhere and getting you to live with him. Really? And I thought, this'll be a disaster. <laughs> this'll be an absolute disaster. Are you he sure, Josh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Aww. He said, I can get somewhere. He said, I'll get somewhere around you. He said, where you live. He said, I only need two bedrooms for Callum, one for me, one for Callum. Aww. And I'm thinking, yeah, that'll be a disaster. Oh, but just but I'm thinking at the same that. time, what a great documentary that'd have been. Could have been. It'd have been fly on the wall. That'd have been better than the Kardashians you ever would be. I feel good. I'm, I'm on a I'm on a good path, and my life feels good, and everything feels good. But there was so many. Thi there was the book for me was a clarity, but then there were still a few questions. I want. I, I wanted to. I, I had questions like, did my dad say he loved me? Yeah, because he didn't say it to me. Did he say it to you? Yeah. You know. I got a call from Phil to come and meet him and my dad at the office. Nothing like this had ever happened before. I knew it was a bad sign. He understood that the end was coming soon. And I don't think that was ever my dad's intention to not Absolutely. leave me anything. Absolutely. But I remember we, I, there's two moments that I remember so clear of you and I together, is that one of them was, you called me and you said, come to my office, North End Road. Yeah, when you had that office. At the time, when my dad's around, I don't think about collecting that shit. I don't think about saving it. I don't think about having my own because it's all there. And I'm like, it's my dad, oh, it's easy, it's all gettable, you know? So then I remembered my dad saying, well, I've got a business idea, yeah. and that my dad was supposed to sign, but never did, is that the case? He never signed this will. I think he would've wanted me to have some stuff. So for nobody to understand that, shocks me completely, yeah, yeah. you know? I've got three or four bits that are lovely that I want you to have. Oh, thank you. I want you to have them, but they were, trust me, they're given to me yeah. 
They're, yeah. they're not anybody's but I don't want to take it from that. I don't want but to no, that but I want you to have these things. Okay. I want you to have them. I don't want to be a burden on anybody. You know, I don't want to be a burden on you if it's yours, because I know that you love my dad, you know what I mean? So I don't want to... But I want you to have it. She's parked up anywhere here. Coming for a session? I'll come, yeah. You're gonna train? No, I was just gonna put my gym clothes on. So I went to the yoga retreat, so. You doing yoga? I know, can you imagine? <laughs> Even, like, I'm thinking to myself 10 years ago, I was laughing at it. Yeah. Even three years ago, yep. I wouldn't have pictured myself doing yoga. Yep. And now I just went to a yoga retreat. I'm yeah. happy when you're happy. Yeah, good. Well, you know. When you're healthy. Yeah. And when I know that leaving Malibu and coming back to England and seeing you turn yourself around and not go the same path as your father. Yeah. That fills for a whole me reason. with joy, yeah, good. complete joy. And for so many years, I thought it was cool to smoke, it was cool to party, it was cool to do that because I knew that's the one thing I could do. As I got older and as I got wiser, and even in the past two, three years, so much growth I'm finding out going on myself. Obviously just with age, getting more comfortable in my skin, my book was a massive factor on changing my life. I had an idea of what I wanted to do, you know? I sat there with my full beard, having some crisis of what I'm doing with myself. You know, to think however much time it's been since then, you know, I've created this, and I want it to be yours. I thought I'd use it as an opportunity to start this new regime. Now, when I walk down the road, I don't hide my face anymore. He was a shit dad to me, but he will always be part of me. Maybe and hopefully my story can be helpful to people who are going through similar things. I play against a lot of good players, legends, but one I love. George Best. <laughs> this one is the excellent player. 